Good morning, Celebration Church, wherever you're at. Thanks for joining us in worship.
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. What a moment you have brought me to such a freedom I have found in you you're the healer who makes all things new yeah 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 I'm not going back I'm moving ahead I'm here to declare to you my past is over and you all things are made new surrender my life to Christ I'm moving moving forward you have risen with all power in your hands you have given me Second chance, hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going back, I'm moving ahead, I'm here to declare to you, my past is over. that Jesus makes all things new. We love new things. New things speak of potential and opportunity and shiny until it gets real close into our hearts. And then new can start to sound like change and unknown 
And in a season when so many things are unknown, it gets pretty easy to forget that new is really a great promise of God. So I thought maybe we could all use the reminder this morning that God is the author of new. The enemy comes to seek and steal and destroy, but God comes to take those broken destruction parts and he makes them new and he makes them into something beautiful and good. If you remember the Easter story, when Jesus' disciples, um, after he had been buried in the tomb, they were so overwhelmed with their grief over his death that when he had come back to life, they didn't even recognize him. So my hope is that we can take a lesson from the disciples on what not to do during this season. Let's not be so overwhelmed by the things that are rightly weighing on our hearts that we miss what it is that God is doing that's new inside of us and around us. Let's be on the lookout for it, okay? And when you see it, do me a favor. Would you tell a friend? We could all use the encouragement during this time and the reminder that God is doing a new thing and it is always, always good. I'm gonna ask you all to join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. But wherever you are this morning, if you're with some people in your home, would you just take their hand as a sign of unity, not just for us as Celebration Church, but for the global church. All across the world this morning, people are praying this prayer together. So let's join them now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have come across a Celebration Church service for one of the first times online, we're so glad that you decided to stop and join us this morning. Celebration Church is one church, but we have three different locations. We call them campuses. We have one here in Green Bay and also in Appleton and Stevens Point. Each campus has live worship and kids ministry and communion. But what joins us all together is the teaching of our lead pastor, Mark Gunger, who preaches live in Green Bay, but is watched via video in both Appleton and Stevens Point. We, of course, are going through a season where we're all watching via screens for a while, but our hope is that once we can all come back together and gather in person, that you will walk through the doors of one of the Celebration Church campuses so you can meet how warm and wonderful the people of Celebration Church really are. I would love it this morning if all of you watching online, if you're new or if you're a regular part of Celebration Church, would you just give a little shout out? Show us some likes or some loves if you're on Facebook. You can type in a little hello if you're online through the church website or our app this morning. We would just love to know that you are joining in with us. If you are watching on Facebook, I would also encourage you, would you tag a friend who you'd love to be watching service with this morning or share this video? It's just one of the ways that we can help people to know that church is still happening in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Amen. All right. I have a couple of announcements for you. Very quickly, first off, I do want to let you know that as usual, we will be participating in communion this morning. We'll be sharing that time at the end of service. So I would love it if you would go grab a little bit of bread or wine, or maybe it's toast and juice, whatever it is that you have this morning, so that when we get to that time later on in service, you'll be able to participate in communion with all of us. The other thing that I wanna make you aware of this morning is we've of course been making so many adjustments as we've been needing to shift ministry here at the church to online and digital and things like that. So I would love for you to go and check out our church website, celebrationchurch.tv. You'll notice when you get there, we put a button. For those of you who in this season are needing a little extra help, or maybe you're able to provide a little extra help. You might need someone to go get groceries for you or um, any number of other things. We just wanna do our best as a church to connect those needs with those who are able to fill them for you. So make sure that you check out our website, see some of the things that are happening there. You're gonna hear more about it in the news in just a second as well. We have lots of things we're trying to do just to help keep all of us connected during this time of physical distancing. And now my friends, here is the Celebration News.
Hey, good morning, Celebration Church. Welcome to week two of Church at Home. Although we can't meet in person for a while, that doesn't mean we can't meet face-to-face. So we've got some great opportunities for you to stay connected to the church and to each other. If you're new to Celebration Church or you just want to learn more about who we are as a church, join us on Monday evening at 6 p.m. or Thursday at noon for step one of the Celebration Growth Track. The monthly growth track is made up of four consecutive weekly experiences designed to help you grow in your relationship with God, connect to the church, and reach your full potential. This week, you'll hear some ins and outs of who we are as a church, learn what we believe, our leadership, and how we intentionally organize our church. You also have the opportunity to become a Celebration Church member. You can find the link to join us and more information at the Church at Home tab on our website. If you have kids in sixth grade or younger, check your email for links to the Celebration Kids activities or go to celebrationchurch.tv slash church at home. We'll have the entire lesson available for you to do at home. We encourage you to have quality family time as you connect with Jesus. For those of you with fifth through 12th graders, youth is going online. We'll be posting video teachings on our social media, Instagram and Facebook each Wednesday and then Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Elizabeth and myself will be going live on the youth social media platforms to hang out and chat. We'll also be creating additional content via social media to engage with our students. Did someone say youth TikTok? Yeah, they did. So make sure you follow us on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook at Celebration Youth. While we'll miss seeing everyone in person, this does not change the fact that Wednesdays are the best night of the week. We can't wait to see you there. We'll also continue to offer growth track, water baptism, and small groups through live video platforms. Any opportunity we can get face-to-face, even if it's through a video screen, will help us all keep in community and faith as we move forward. You can visit our website or Facebook page for more details. We're so glad to have you with us today. Enjoy the service. This is Celebration Church, but it's more than just a building or a church. We have a calling to be a place where people can find a relationship with God instead of religion. A place where freedom is found and acceptance given and every person can discover their purpose and experience the kind of fulfillment only God can give. Together we will raise, lead, and empower a generation to change the world. Here, Jesus is famous and all the glory goes to God. This is celebration. This is our family. Welcome home. Good morning. Welcome to Celebration Church. So glad that you have joined with us online this morning. Before we begin uh, and get into our message, let's all recite together the Apostles' Creed. We do this every Sunday here at Celebration Church. The Apostles' Creed is uh, one of the oldest recorded things in uh, Christian history. When you go back, it's almost 2,000 years ago, and this is one of the things that people would give to new converts that were about to get baptized. They would have them memorize this creed, and they would say it together. And then it became so popular, so meaningful, that they started uh, saying it together as part of their worship whenever they would gather together. So this is an old part of Christianity that we have connected in with uh, what we're doing today. So let's say this together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who for us and for our salvation was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Christian Church, the fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, so glad that you've joined with us uh, this morning and certainly appreciated Greg and our music team. This one, that first song was awesome. This, I don't think I've ever heard that song before, but that was the bomb as I was walking in here this morning. Wow. Very, very cool. We are very blessed and have some of the most talented musicians in the world and great tech guys who make all of it sound so amazing as it goes out on the, uh, our streams on our website, celebrationchurch.tv or on Facebook or f- Facebook or wherever else we are. What's TikTok? <laughs> I never heard of a TikTok. Except my clock. TikTok, TikTok. 
It's, it's a new thing. And it, you'll introduce me to it. I, I can barely figure out Facebook, man. I don't understand all this stuff. I gave up on Twitter. I'm a twit. I don't get it with the little things. Anyway, uh, so glad that you are all our, our tech guys who make this possible uh, and thank them for coming in during this time of quarantine in the state of Wisconsin and much around uh, the world. Before I get into the message, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to give this morning. Obviously, we're not gathered together and can't hand out the buckets or whatever, but I uh, want to encourage you right now to go. Uh, if you're watching at, on our regular uh, page, celebrationchurch.tv, you'll see a button there to give. Push the button and it'll get, send you the, to the right page so that you can make a contribution this morning. Or if you are just uh, uh, using your phone, you can go and text to this number, 77977. That's the number you're going to text, 77977. And then in the message part, you just top, type CCWI, which stands for Celebration Church, Wisconsin. CCWI, and then the dollar amount. And do something, even if it's just a dollar. Don't be one of these people who just sits and loves to take, but never gives back. And right now, there's not a whole lot people can do in terms of giving back. But one thing you can do, particularly in this time uh, of uncertainty and stuff, is to step out in faith and support the kingdom of God. Uh, the Bible tells us this very specifically that we are to contribute financially to those who bless us spiritually. So if you're watching this morning, obviously, or you wouldn't be hearing this, uh, you are receiving spiritual life and encouragement. Now, the Bible says in response to that, you should give back financially to that. So take a moment, uh, push that button, send that text to uh, 77977 and type CCWI in your dollar amount and it'll take you to wherever you need to go to complete that. So don't be a slacker <laughs> and sit around and do nothing. Don't, you know, I, I, I don't get it. Don't just take. We live in a world of just take, 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 take. Like, remember Pac-Man? I don't know TikTok, but I remember Pac-Man. You remember, you remember Pac-Man? And Mrs. Pac-Man? That was even cooler than the real Pac-Man. These are the video games where this little round ball was going around eating things. <laughs> and you'd run around and see how many levels you could get. And a lot of people are just like Pac-Man. <laughs> they eat. <laughs> Don't contribute to anything, but they love to suck everything up they can. <laughs> Don't be like that. Don't be a Pac-Man or a Mrs. Pac-Man. All right? Or a single Pac-Man or whatever your status is this morning. All right, we are now in the uh, fifth Sunday of Lent. Uh, as we're coming up to Easter, this is going to be really, really odd. It looks at this point that there will not be a big gathering unless something changes uh, for Easter Sunday morning. Usually our, most churches are their biggest Sunday of the year. This is going to be really weird. <clears throat> but we'll write it out and we'll just take it one step at a time. Uh, Lent means, the word means spring. So this is a time of spring coming out of death into new life. But I have to tell you, for a lot of us, it don't feel like no spring. It might, and the weather, although in, here in Wisconsin, it really doesn't. There's, there's still snow out there. But uh, for most people, it's, the weather's getting nice, but it doesn't feel like very life-giving right now because we are stuck in the middle of this coronavirus thing that has the world coming unglued and beside itself. Uh, different categories of people, there are those who think people aren't taking this strong enough actions. There's those who think we've been doing about the right thing. And there are those of us who think it's been a severe overreaction. Whatever category you're in, we are in what we are in. And, uh, and now we just write it out. To be honest with you, I've not been very stressed by this whole thing, uh, even in the midst of all this uncertainty. And this might sound really odd, but I'm an odd person. Um, the thing that's so comforting to me is that it's just not me. <laughs> Everybody's messed up. Everybody's thrown into the situation at the same time. I actually take great comfort in it. You know, it's like something when and you're going through something and you're the only one going through it and nobody else knows what's going on. And you're, man, I hate that stuff because now the pressure's on. What about me? What can I do? And, uh, you know, but when everybody's dealing with the same thing, it brings a level of comfort to know that you're all as miserable as I am. And, uh, you, know, you know, it's kind of different. It's like, uh, 
uh, when you're in class and the teacher calls on you, Mark, what do you think? And, and then you panic because everybody's looking to you for an answer. But when they look at the whole class, what do y'all think? And none of us know anything. You don't panic. So I, I remember once I was uh, back in the early days uh, <laughs> before I was in ministry here at Celebration Church. I, I owned a video production company. And we would go around and we would, we would produce uh, videos for big companies and politicians and stuff. And we'd come into these boardrooms and have these conversations with these people about whatever they are wanting to discuss. <clears throat> it was so boring. I'm telling you. I, I was, and I don't drink coffee. I should have. <laughs> but so anyway, we're in this meeting and five minutes into it, all I'm hearing is blah, 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 blah. I'm not paying attention to anything. And, and these are big accounts, right? And so the, the CEO looks at me and goes, so, Mark, what do you think? And I'll th never think the panic <laughs> that went through my ma mind. Ah! But I stayed cool. I went, huh. And I looked at the guy next to me and said, I don't know, what do you think? And it passed it off brilliantly. <laughs> oh, man, thank God for that. Otherwise, I would have went, I don't know what you're talking about. But I was able to pull it off. And uh, then I caught up paying attention. After that, I was paying attention, I'll tell you that. Anyway, so there's not a whole lot we can do, but obviously we are in a time of great, great uncertainty. The thing is, who knows what's going to happen? I don't know how this plays out. I have no idea. Uh, I don't think, you know, there's very few things, you know, Solomon wrote once, there's nothing new under the sun. Of course, he was depressed and for him, life sucked and everything was awful. And he, his whole purpose of life is you're, you're born, you work, and then you die. <laughs> so he wasn't in a particularly good place. Uh, ah, there's nothing new under the sun. And generally speaking, that has been true. But I got to tell you, this one's new. This one's new. I, don't, I can't think of another time in human history where the entire world economy was suspended all at once. And again, the comforting thing there is they're all suspended. It's not like just America and everybody else is getting ahead of us or, you know, whatever the deal is. So it's, this has never happened before. We have no idea how this is going to play out. We don't know what's going to happen. Some of you, you're not sure if you're still going to have a job. Some of you, are not sure if you're still going to have businesses and stuff like that. But what I can say is, uh, I think it's good news in the fact that uh, everyone's going through this together. And for us, people of faith, I feel bad for those who don't have any faith. And I'm certainly hoping that during this time, there will be people who don't have faith, that will start to take faith seriously, realizing, hey, life is very, you know, I haven't started preaching yet. <laughs> you know, people walk around and, and they're kind of, air in, in our own, like in America, you know, where, oh, we got everything, we got money, we got jobs, who needs God, da, 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 da. And you kind of get arrogant a little bit. And I think God just sits and laughs sometimes. All it takes is one bug, one itty bitty bug that nobody can see and the entire world collapses overnight. So, I mean, man, if, you're, if your hope and your trust is in the things of this world, oh, how awful is your world? You know, the good news for those of us who know Christ is that our hope and trust is not in this world. We live in this world. We deal with this world. We still have to deal with this world. But our hope and trust far exceeds what's happening around us. As a result, those of faith are running, work, walking in much greater peace and contentment during this time of uncertainty than those who don't. And there's some of you, your faith is kind of weak. You're a Christian, but you're, you know, just barely, <laughs> barely in, you know, you got, you got one foot in the, in the world, one foot in Jesus, and you're kind of never taking this, and you're kind of rattled too. Hopefully this is a time that will cause you to have a little come to Jesus moment, literally, where you'll start taking your life more seriously, eternity more seriously, and your faith more seriously, so that you can ride through things like this and not be filled with fear. So anyway, this morning in this fifth Sunday of Lent, coming up to Easter, I want to read to you from uh, the Old Testament, starting out uh, from Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was one of them, they call these, you know, different prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Uh, you can tell the difference because the major prophets are really thick. <laughs> The minor ones are really the little tiny ones. Uh, but Ezekiel was one of these major prophets. Uh, he lived at the same time as Isaiah. Actually, they were contemporaries. And what had happened was after 
centuries of Israel rebelling against God, uh, judgment, serious judgment. There were little minor judgments that came a long way where God would kick their butts and kind of bring them in line. But this was a major one, and he'd been warning them for a long time. Uh, the Old Testament pretty much boils down to, very simply, creation, and then God finds one guy, Abraham, and through Abraham brings a whole, uh, all the blessings of God through the Jewish nation and then the Messiah. So that's kind of how the whole thing goes. Uh, along the way, they decided they wanted kings after they came into the promised land. And God said, you don't want a king. It's just going to give you pain. No, no, we want kings. All right, you can have kings. So then Saul and King David uh, was, the, was the major king. And then all these other kings came along. And most of them were rotten, disgusting, horrible human beings that God was constantly having to deal with. And you can read about the kings in uh, two Old Testament books called First and Second Kings. <laughs> That's how you know it's about the kings. And you read from one to the other. And some of these guys, they're horrible, awful. They did terrible things. And God would warn them, you better stop or I am going to kick your rear end. And it goes on and on and on and on. And as you're reading it, you know, I'm reading this and about halfway through, I'm like, <laughs> kill him already. <laughs> What's taking so long? So just as a word of encouragement, God is really patient. The Bible says over and over and over and over again, he is slow to anger. He does not have a quick fuse. I, the Puerto Rican, have a very quick fuse. Mine is more of a hand grenade where you pull the pin and step back in a couple of seconds because <laughs> boom, it's going to go off. Pray for me. I still need to improve on that. And I haven't gotten very far in low these many years. But, uh, but God has a really, really slow fuse. Those of you who think God's mad at you and is going to, no, 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 no. He, he is so slow to anger. And if you doubt me, just read First and Second Kings. There's a lot of reading and you will see centuries goes by. One king after another, after another. And he would warn them and warn them and warn them and warn them. And then finally, he had it up to here and the butt kicking came in. And now the uh, Babylonians come in, and, uh, and in a couple of waves, they started shipping off people into Babylon. Uh, initially, they just took the cream of the crop. They would come in, they controlled everything, and they would take the best people, the smartest, the most well-educated people, because they wanted, as they were building their kingdom, they, they conquered all these lands, and they wanted to take the most brilliant people all back to incorporate them into their culture and, and benefit from them. That was their plan to build this long-lasting uh, kingdom that they had. So the Babylons came in, came in and did this, and Ezekiel was taken up, him and his family, in the second wave of people off into Babylonian captivity. Isaiah was still back in Jerusalem. And they both kept prophesying to Israel, you need to stop. God has had it. He is serious. You would think they'd get a clue with all of a sudden the Babylonians coming in and, and starting to control everything, but they still uh, would not change and kept warning. And then finally the hammer fell and the enemies came in and they destroyed uh, Jerusalem and wiped the city down to the ground, killed so many people, and then everybody was taken off into Babylonian captivity. Everything that they had built over the centuries of the Jewish world was completely, totally, and utterly destroyed. And you can imagine the depths of sorrow uh, and despair that swept over uh, the people. And at this point, there aren't that many people left. Uh, there was just a remnant, quite frankly, because they came in and they just started wiping these people out. And uh, wow, eventually, I mean, you know, you don't want to push things too far because at some point uh, things get really bad. And then they pushed it. And then finally, everything falls apart. But then uh, Ezekiel starts changing his prophecies to prophecies of hope. He had warned them. Sure enough, they didn't listen. Isaiah warned them, they didn't listen. Judgment comes. And now Ezekiel is still now, and he's prophesying to the people. And we want to pick up at, at chapter 37, verse 1. He says, and he has this incredible vision. This is like, <laughs> like an acid trip. <laughs> this, I mean, some of these visions, man, wow. So this is an intense vision. Read this with me. The hand of the Lord was on me, he writes, 
And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord. So he's having this vision. And he set me in the middle of a valley. And it was full of bones. That's creepy. Okay. And he led me back and forth. So he's walking and he sees all these dead bones, all scattered and bones scattered everywhere. And uh, he said, I saw a great many bones on the floor of this valley, bones that were very dry. And God asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, well, sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That old spiritual, the knee bone's connected to the leg bone. <laughs> Actually, it comes from the story. Anyway, prophesy these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will breathe in you and you will come to life and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. He starts saying this to all these bones. And as I was prophesying, prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. <laughs> all these bones start shaking. <laughs> like I said, what a weird trip, huh? And then the bones started coming together, bone to bone. So all these skeletons, they start coming, and he starts making all these, they start making skeletons everywhere as these bones come together. And then I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. So all of a sudden, these bones are now covered with flesh, uh, and so now all, just all bodies are laying everywhere. Again, this is one creepy vision. So now no more bones. He sees his bones all come together again, and now they're just all these lifeless bodies laying everywhere. Uh, and then the Lord says to him, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breathe, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. <laughs> Intense vision, right? And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy, to, and of course, that's how they felt, right? They felt ho totally hopeless at this point. There's not that much of us left of our entire nation. We've lost everything. It's hopeless and he said, prophesy to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves. I'm going to bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring, them up, uh, bring you up from them. And I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Now, when uh, Ezekiel is speaking these words, this seems like the furthest thing from reality for them. And that's part of the deal. When you are in the midst of the worst of worst circumstances, it seems hope is impossible. But what I want you to know this morning is it's never, ever hopeless. Even in the midst of this hopelessness, God was speaking to them saying, look, this is all going to come back to life. And as you read through the history of the Old Testament, you, start, you see it come back to life. Eventually, they come back. The nation prospers. They start multiplying again. They come back. They rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And all of that is in place when Jesus comes uh, and not too long of a distance afterwards. So when Jesus comes, he comes into Jerusalem. The temple's there. The city's rebuilt. All of that had been completely destroyed and now had been rebuilt, which was a prophecy that Ezekiel had spoken uh, at a time when they had no hope. But God said, listen, there is always hope. It's never too late. Some people are wondering right now, what's going to happen? What if I lose my job? I will prophesy to you. You're going to get another job. So what if I lose my business? I will prophesy to you this morning. You'll get another business. It's never too late. There's going to be opportunities actually that come from this thing that will be amazing. There will actually be people who will become multimillionaires, <laughs> believe it or not, because they will see opportunities that nobody else is seeing and because everything is changing. This is a time of a reset. Here's a time of opportunity. Don't just walk around like Eeyore with a cloud over you. Oh, bother, and everything's awful. Look, this is a great chance of a new reset. At some point in the not very distant future, this whole thing's gonna be lifted. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I can say this to you, that we, as people of faith, have God on our side. And when God is on our side, you have nothing 
to fear. It's like having Superman as your best friend. Or forget Superman, just having a big guy. <laughs> you know, I've been in parts of the world where we've gone into very dangerous places. Uh, but, you know, you're young. And when you're young, you think you're going to live forever. <laughs> Nothing bad's going to happen to me, right? And when I think back on some of the places we've been around the world and some of the circumstances, I get totally creeped out. I'm thinking, what was I thinking, you know? But I remember sometimes one of the things, that, because at the time, you know, I was 118 pounds dripping wet uh, back then. And, uh, and half of that was just my hair. And, uh, and <laughs> that's just bones walking around. And, uh, but I always felt safe, usually, whenever there was another big guy with us, Right? Some big, you know, and I like hanging around with really big guys because when things get intense and you're in a dangerous situation and it looks a little threatening, it's nice to be walking around with a really big guy <laughs> because you just feel better. I'm telling you what, you got a really big guy walking alongside you. His name is Jesus and he ain't afraid of nothing and this is all going to be okay. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what you've gone through or what you're going through now, God always fills us with hope. He is constantly, throughout the entire Bible, and of course, you know, I know some of you got the time right now to read the whole Bible. <laughs> got nothing else to do. Locked at home. You'll see the story of in the midst of failure, in the midst of death, in the midst of destruction, one thing always keeps happening. New life. New life. It's like it cannot be stopped. It's like looking out the window here, as I see through our door there, in the state of Wisconsin, it looks like an atomic bomb just went off. <laughs> There's nothing but death out there. There's no life. There's no leaves. There's no nothing. Just a bunch of trees that's in there and surrounded by snow. It looks horrible. But you know what? No matter how dead it looks right now, life is going to come. It always comes. Always new life. And God has a way of doing those things. A uh, reading from Psalm 130 this morning. Uh, verse 1, it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, Hear my voice, Lord. Let my ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? In other words, if God did not let you off of your sins, we'd all be doomed. I know there's people who think that the way this works is as long as you're a little better than you were bad, right? There's a lot of you listening to me right now. You, you don't claim to be a Christian. You're just checking things out right now, maybe because of everything and the uncertainty, you're starting to look to faith. Most people you go to and you talk about God and stuff and they'll usually, well, I'm, I'm not that bad. And we always compare ourselves to someone worse than us. So we feel better. You know, if uh, I have a neighbor who's a real jerk, I think, well, I'm not as big a jerk as he is, so I'm, I'm okay, you know? So they think the way this all works is when you die, as long as you're a little better than you were bad, more good than bad, then, yeah, then this is a scale, and then, then, then you get to heaven. That's not how this works. You don't understand the seriousness of our sins, the seriousness of our sins. Our sins doom us. Your sins go like this, all right? There is no uh, little time of balancing. Even the simplest of sins puts us in a bad, bad place of absolute hopelessness. Uh, say, well, well, that sounds terrible. Well, yeah, it is terrible. That's the good news, though. That's why Jesus came, died on the cross, so that he could take away the sins of the world. You don't work off your sins. You don't try to balance out your sins. You need to get rid of your sins. You need uh, forgiveness and redemption. It's the only hope that we have. It's not like there's this little, t you know. I remember once, I heard an analogy of if you take two people and you put one on top of Mount Everest, the highest point on the earth, and then you dig the deepest, deepest pit humanly possible and you put another guy down. So we're talking a massive difference, okay? Mount Everest, the highest point and the lowest point on earth. And then you say to both of them, okay, now reach up and touch the stars. Well, it doesn't matter, you see. No matter how high or low, it's impossible. You can't. You can't touch the stars. And the same thing is with all of us uh, in our state of, of sin. Some people are a lot worse sinners than others. This I will concede. Uh, Becky, she's a horrible sinner. All right, but <laughs> I got an audience of one here. My, my audience. 
and she's so sweet. She still laughs at my stupid jokes. So anyway, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not, there are people who are worse human beings than others, but it's like Everest and the biggest hole. Now, now reach the heavens. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can't do it. Your sins, whether they be great or whether they be few, still makes you unable, unable, whatever the right English word is, to touch heaven and to touch God. The only way to deal with sins is to have your sins taken away, which, thank God, is what Jesus did. And it's why Christians celebrate. It's why we sing. It's why we do what we do and why we can have our spring in our steps, even though we're not supposed to be outside stepping at all because of the coronavirus. We're bouncing inside <laughs> because we have hope. Why? Our sins have been forgiven. But what's going to happen next? I don't know. Why aren't you worried? Not really. Why? My sins have been taken away. God loves me. There's always hope for me. So he says, Lord, who could stand? But in verse 4, the next, in that psalm, it says, but with you there is forgiveness. Hallelujah. So that we can with reverence serve you. So if you kept a record of our sins, Lord, no one can stand. But with you there is forgiveness. It's always a situation of hope and never a situation of hopelessness. I, I can't tell what time it is. I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> Where are you going to go? <laughs> I could preach for an hour. <laughs> Who cares? All right. Um, uh, let me end with, with a reading from the gospel here, the gospel of John, chapter 11. Now, and, I, and I almost, almost every year I come at, at this time back to this. This is one of the most amazing accounts in the scripture. It is the most amazing miracle Jesus ever performed. Now, there was a man named Lazarus. He was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This is Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick. She was the one, same one that poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair, this dramatic story. This is the lady. So when this happens, they became friends with the family, Jesus. And Jesus becomes really good friends with her brother, Lazarus. In fact, uh, they refer to him as the one that he, that, 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 that he loved in the family. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love, talking about Lazarus, is sick. So when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, let me ask you a question. If you are facing death and the Lord says to you, this will not end in death, what do you think? I'm not going to die, right? Guess what happens? He dies, well, what happened there? Well, he says it won't end in death. See, the end still hadn't gotten there yet. Oh, man, I'm telling you. A lot of times when things go bad for us, we think this is the end. This is over. I was trusting God. God would say it would be okay. It's not okay. And we lose hope. But you're giving up too soon because it's never over. Never, ever over. So, well, death is pretty final. One would think. <laughs> But that's not what happens. So anyway, uh, it turns out that, uh, that he dies. Uh, Jesus, in verse 11, uh, told his disciples, uh, look, we need to go back. Uh, our, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Jesus was aware of what had happened. No one had told him, but he's Jesus. He knows what's going on. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going there to wake him up. And the disciples said, because the disciples had heard that he was sick. He says, well, Lord, if he sleeps, good. Well, he's going to get better. He's going to recover. Don't wake him up. <laughs> and Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, listen, boys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to them, to go to uh, him. Why would he say that? He says, because if I was there, I wouldn't have let him suffer. I would have healed him. And I'm glad I wasn't there. And to go ahead and let him die. Okay, doesn't that sound like a horrible thing? Now, honestly, if I'm facing death, I hope the miracle comes before the death because <laughs> I don't want to die. But in this case, sometimes God intentionally delays. And the intentional delay is only a delay. You say, when I was trusting God and, and, and my business failed and, and I was trusting God, I still lost my job and I was still trusting God and my husband still left me. And it's all, no, don't give up. All right, there's nothing worse than death here. And even in the face of death, Jesus said, okay, he's dead. Now let's go get him. Well, we should have gotten there ahead of time. He said, no, I'm glad I wasn't there ahead of time. 
so you can check out what's about to happen. So anyway, verse 20, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to him. Mary stayed at home because she's ticked. <laughs> Where was he? All right. Uh, Lord, Martha said, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Verse four, uh, 34, Jesus said, well, where, where did you lay him? And she said, well, we'll come here and see. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35 of John 11, Jesus wept. This is the shortest verse in the Bible. Now, the Bible was not originally written in verses. Uh, there wasn't chapters and verses. The reason they eventually added chapters and verses, and that didn't even come to completion until uh, what uh, ninth, uh, the 1500s, so 15th century. Um, took a long time <laughs> for anybody. They started breaking it down into sections, and then they uh, eventually started breaking it down into chapters, and then this guy by the name of uh, Robert Stevens or St Stephanus or whatever comes and he says, you know, this would help if we actually gave numbers to everything. So he goes out, this one guy does all this. Everything that we're reading, well, one guy does all of this. That's a lot of work. How could he do it? Because in the 1500s, there wasn't any TV. <laughs> There's nothing else to do. So they just work all day long. So he broke it all down. And quite brilliantly, when he gets to this passion of, of scripture, he just leaves two words in, in that one verse. It's the shortest verse, Jesus wept. So if you're ever on Jeopardy and they want to know what the shortest verse of the Bible is, you can go, ding, Jesus wept, all right? So anyway, they're watching him weep and, and the Jews are going, wow, see how much he loved him. And then others complain, can't imagine that in the midst of something, everybody's whining somewhere, right? So he says, well, couldn't have he who opened the eyes of the blind kept this man from dying? Where was he? All right, uh, and you don't want to be in that whiny group. Man, don't be in the whiny group. Nobody likes the whiny group. Uh, and then the next verse, it says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take away the stone. Martha says, but Lord, uh, the sister of the dead man, Martha, by this time, there's a bad odor. He stinks. Whoa, he's been in there four days. So he, this is the incredible part of the miracle. There's one thing for someone to drop dead and then Jesus touch him and brings him back to life, you know, Maybe he was just mostly dead. Maybe he wasn't really. There's all kinds of, you know, ways you can look at this. Uh, but when you're dead four days in a tomb, we've pretty much established you are completely and entirely dead. So he waits until that much death has set in. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, Come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. He looked like a mummy hopping out of there. Uh, man, I'd have had a heart attack right on the spot. <laughs> if I go to a funeral and you come hopping out of your basket, your case, I'm, I'm having, a, especially if you've been, you're in a basket and you've been, <laughs> something wrong with me. You come out of that, man, I'm really impressed, all right? But anyway, so anyway, so this incredible miracle happened. What was the point of all of this? Jesus knew it from the beginning. When you read the account, as soon as he heard he was sick, he knew what was going to happen. He intentionally delayed. He told his disciples, we didn't read all of it because I'm late. But uh, just said, just relax. He slowed down. Finally, okay, let's go wake him up. Oh, good, he's sleeping. No, he's dead. Jesus knew the whole thing. By the time he got there, it was four days. He does all of this to show us one incredible thing. And that is, it is never, ever, too late. All right, I'm going to ask our musicians to come back out here as we get ready now to take communion. If you uh, can, grab some bread, some wine, some elements uh, from your kitchen there. Maybe you've already done it. We're about to uh, get ready here to uh, have our time of communion. Uh, you know, the Bible says that before we take communion, we're supposed to examine ourselves. Where are we at? Where am I at with God? How have you been doing this last week? You've been full of fear. You've been full of paranoia. You get your spouse getting on your nerves. <laughs> You're barking at each other. Kids driving you crazy. Look, sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make mistakes. The point of our time of communion is we stop, we reflect, and just a time of God help me to get things right. And in, with that in mind, I want to pray a prayer of forgiveness for all of us as we're watching right now. So if you'll just uh, bow your heads with me, let's pray this prayer. Uh, allow me to pray this prayer over you. Father, before we partake of the bread and the wine this morning, in obedience to the scriptures, we pause to examine ourselves 
if we've sinned against you in any way. Maybe something we did, something that we didn't do. Maybe we haven't loved you with our whole heart. Perhaps we haven't loved our neighbors as ourselves. Maybe even those people we're stuck in the house with said things we shouldn't have said. Uh, whatever our situation is this morning, over this last week, for the sake of your beloved son, Jesus, who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins, have mercy on us. We know there is forgiveness with you as we read in the psalm. So we ask you now, forgive us of our sins. Take away our sins, Lamb of God. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And as we're all just in a moment of prayer right now, as your heads are still bowed, maybe you're new to faith. Maybe you're watching this and you're kind of looking at a distance and you're thinking, man, I need this. I need God in my life. I need some stability. I need some hope and steadiness in the midst of a storm that we're all going through. And, and I don't like living in fear. Just take a moment right now, in your own words, ask Jesus to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to fill you with new hope. Amen. So anyway, go ahead and get your, your bread and your wine together. The band's going to sing a little bit here as we enter in a time of worship, and then we'll take communion all together after everyone's ready. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens and lay down your shame. your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens. pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine that we partake of this morning, and we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would sanctify these elements and make them to be to us the body and the blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, take this and divide it among you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. 
Let's sing some more of the song. There's joy for the morning, O sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your Beautiful song. Um, if you prayed that prayer this morning, you took a moment and you, you asked Christ into your life, maybe for the very first time, if you'll let us know about it, we'd love to send you a book. It's called Getting Started. It'll answer questions that you have about faith and how to grow in your faith. Uh, if you're watching us online, uh, there's a button on our website. What's, what's it called? Church at Home. Find that Church at Home cl thing. Click all that and you'll find, uh, you'll be able to give us your information and we will send you the book. If you're watching on Facebook, just go to our website after this, our regular website, celebrationchurch.tv, okay? And, uh, and there you'll be able to see that church at home. Click that on there and we'll send you this book absolutely free of charge. Nobody's gonna call you or bug you or irritate you in any way except perhaps your neighbors, but it won't be us. And we'll get you that book and it'll be a big help to you as you start uh, your new walk in faith. And uh, we're so glad that you've been with us this morning. All right, so we're going to wrap this up. Before I speak the uh, final benediction over you, I'd like to pray a prayer. Have I forgotten anything? Is everything good? Okay. So let's, let's pray this prayer. I, I, I said this last week. I want to do this again. It's the prayer of St. Francis. Uh, I think it's a great prayer, particularly in these uncertain times. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Heavenly Father, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you guys. We love you. If there's anything that we can do to help you, please contact the church. Let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you again next Sunday morning. Bye-bye. Need.